This is The Other Side of Midnight, talking with Steve Cates, a.k.a. Dr. Sky, about all things space. Uh, Steve, anything uh, that we should be looking forward uh, to seeing in the night sky soon, whether we're going to go the telescope route, the binoculars route, or just the naked eye, anything that excites you? Absolutely. Here we go. If the listeners go out there all across the country where the show is heard, and proudly so, if you go out on this particular evening, let's say Thursday evening as you're listening, take a look at the moon. And just to the lower right, you'll see a star with the naked eye, even though the moon is now past first quarter. Why am I talking about this star and what is it? It's a star called Spica. It's in the constellation Virgo. And as we celebrate or mark the 40, 246th anniversary of America, just know that this particular star, strange as it is, the star is made up of two blue stars very close together that are egg-shaped because the gravity tugs on them. You can't see that because it's far away. Why am I saying this? The same time the Declaration of Independence was signed and the ink was still wet, there about, plus or minus, you know, a little variance here, the light that you see of the star Spica left when that declaration was signed and just got here now, 246-plus light years away, telling us once again that the sky is a gigantic time machine. For those of you with binoculars and telescopes, a small comet known as C-2017 K2, pan stars, a lot to say, is actually a binocular and telescope object, but I'd do it soon before the moonlight interferes. That comet, Frank, was one of the largest comets discovered so far away from the sun, maybe a nucleus of 10 miles in diameter. It may brighten up as we go through the month. And don't forget, as we move on to the 13th, another of the great supermoons that we have in our sky, this one appropriately named across the nation, as you have the particular season of summer, the full super thunder moon. That's great. And from the history file, real quick, we mark the 114th anniversary of one of the greatest explosions of an object or something that came from space over northern Siberia called the Tunguska event. Allegedly, a six or seven hundred foot in diameter asteroid. The old theory was that it exploded over northern Siberia and that it vaporized on impact and it blew out trees the size of the state of Rhode Island. And some animals died and a few people died. But now the latest theory is the object may have come down in a shallow orbit and the compression wave, the big shock wave, was that of about a 12, and I say it right, a 12 megaton type of a fireball, like a nuclear fireball, and that the object didn't hit the Earth at all because there's no crater and it skipped out into space. But if it happened 30 minutes earlier, according to many in the reliable astronomy and celestial mechanics area, guess what? This object would have happened over London, England. Lucky for us, but sad for those in the path. 800-848-9222. Let me say hello to Joe in Queens, who has been patiently holding. Hello, Joe. Hey, Steve. How you doing? Uh, Good morning. Two, two things I want to bring up. One is yes, sir. the rockets that came back, you know, some of them were put in Flushing Meadow Park as a museum. Did right. they look at those and see a before and after? That You know, and that would be my first question. And also, when you use the astronomical unit, uh, you know, which is supposedly the distance from the Earth to the Sun, and now they say, as of today, Pluto's 345 mm -hmm. uh, astronomical units from the Sun. Is that used a lot? Is that kind of in use, that whole concept. Yeah. I'll start with the second part, uh, Joe. You're right. Astronomical unit, 92 dot 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 million miles away, that's used as a measuring benchmark. But what's interesting, and go off on a tangent here, but maybe not, the Earth right now is farthest from the Sun. We're at a position called aphelion at 94.509 million miles away. So we use the AU unit to still measure what distance out into space. But going back to your first part about spacecraft, all the spacecraft that have come back, they've examined them, you know, tooth and nail. They've looked over every square inch of these things to see what happens. And the biggest damage that comes from any spacecraft coming back, most people know this, but I'll just add, add a little more spice to it, is that the great heat that is, you know, expended on these objects when they come through the atmosphere, it's easy maybe to get up to space, though that's difficult to some. It's even more challenging to come back because you will burn up and even if you were an astronaut just floating out in space, you would eventually decay your own orbit, and you'd meet a fiery end to your life. So they've studied these very closely, and the most important part of these is how do you protect the astronauts, cosmonauts, or tikonauts from the impending doom that would happen if you didn't have the proper heat shielding. 
So, so far, those technologies have proved to be pretty good. Let me squeeze in at least one more call here. Denise is on Long Island. Hello, Denise. Hi, Frank and uh, Dr. Skye. It's a pleasure to speak with you. Thank Dr. you. Skye, I just wanted to give um, recognition and a little memorabilia. Uh, my lifetime partner was a part of the landing on the moon. He was in top wow. management at the time. We awesome. lived the history. Um, yeah, it was pretty awesome at that time because sure. the technology didn't exist, but the exactly. perseverance and the belief that nothing could stop them from getting on the moon. Being right. at the Cape, having tragic things happen when the astronauts had, you know, that horrific fire on the pad and there was a lockdown on the Cape. Horrible. I mean, he worked unbelievable hours. Everybody did. And I am so very proud of him. And I can remember going, even having the ability of being in the mock-up of the limb. Yes. And uh, there were memories at that time where I can remember Apollo 13, where Steve Kranz even said... And, and I'm going to allow Steve to respond, Denise, because we only have about 40 seconds here. Uh, Steve, uh, anything yes. you want to add in closing? Well, Denise, blessings on your partner. As we talk about these great space heroes, thank you for adding that to this conversation. Frank, it's a privilege and honor to be back on the other side of midnight with you as we conclude this Dr. Sky adventure, but thank you. And if people want to get in touch with you, if they have questions via email, how can they reach you? Use this email, drskyshow at gmail.com. That's D-R-S-K-Y show at gmail.com. I'd be happy to respond. All right. Coming up in just a moment, we're going to talk about grandparents and dinner, two of my favorite things. Until then, keep asking questions. <laughs>